Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 16 of the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is sparse PCA and nonlinear dimensional T reduction. So, in this lecture, I am going to consider these two variants of principal component analysis, the sparse PCA and non-linear principal component analysis. A sparse PCA is actually a variant of linear PCA which promotes sparsity. It makes some of the loadings to be equal to 0 which are not so important and then it becomes easier for you to interpret the data on the basis of sparse principal components. Sometimes uh, the observations are concentrated around a non-linear feature space. So, in that case, if you are using linear principal component analysis, you will not get proper results and you require some uh, method which takes care of non-linearity present in the data. So, when the observations are concentrated around a non-linear feature space, we may go for non-linear principal component analysis. So, in this lecture, I will discuss this topic also. Now, first we consider the sparse principal components. Now, these are the methods actually which we require to deal with sparsity in very large data sets in different areas such as bioinformatics, image processing, machine learning or web data analysis. In the context of a multiple linear regression model, we have considered this problem, the problem of sparsity and to resolve this problem what we do? We go for some alternative shrinkage estimation procedure like lasso and in lasso we use L1 penalty function which makes some of the regression parameters to be equal to 0. A similar kind of approach we will follow in principal component analysis also to deal with sparsity. Then uh, direction vectors that is your loadings denoted by V j are used to interpret principal components and to observe variables playing a role. Which variables are playing a role in that particular direction vector? So, just like in multiple linear regression model, where your regression coefficients vector beta or different elements of beta are used to interpret which input variables are going to have impact on the output variables or how much impact the input variables have on the output variable. Now, interpretation is made easier if the loadings are sparse. So, if we make use of lasso, it makes some of the regression coefficients to be equal to 0. The regression coefficients which are corresponding to input variables 
not so important for the interpretation of output variable or variations in the output variable. In principal component analysis also, if the loadings are sparse and some of the loadings which are corresponding to the unimportant variables become zero, then it becomes easier for you to interpret the principal components. Further, just like regression problem, PCA with sparse loadings are based on lasso or L1 penalty. So, here also we use L1 penalty for the sparsity. Now, suppose Xc is n cross r data matrix with centered columns, means different elements of the columns are taken as deviation from mean of that column. Now, we consider the Scott class procedure, which again uses the idea of lasso. It maximizes V transpose X C transpose X V V subject to the restriction that summation mod V j is less than or equal to T and V transpose V equal to 1. Remember that in the usual principal component analysis, we maximize this quantity V transpose X C transpose X C V subject to this restriction. But here you have a lasso like constraint also this one. And this lasso like constraint makes some of the loadings to be equal to 0. And this makes V to be sparse. Sparse principal components are obtained by taking the kth component orthogonal to first k minus 1 components. So, we impose this restriction also just like the usual principal component analysis. The kth component is orthogonal to first k minus 1 components. Further, this problem is not convex and the computations are complex. So, if you do not impose this lasso like condition, then uh, you know that you get simple solutions because the problem is convex and you get neat and clean expression for V. But here the problem is not convex, so the computations are complex. Sparse PCA is using regression reconstruction property. So, now we obtain sparse principal components using this regression reconstruction property and for that purpose we solve this equation. Minimum over theta v norm x c i minus theta v transpose x c i plus lambda you have square of L 2 norm of V here plus lambda 1 L 1 norm of V here subject to the L 2 norm of theta is equal to 1. Now, suppose n is greater than r and we take lambda equal to lambda 1 equal to 0. So, this term is not involved, this term is not involved then V is equal to theta and it is the largest principal component direction. So, then actually it is the classical principal component problem and we get V as the largest principal component direction. Now, if R is much, much larger than n, and you have actually high dimensional data, then the solution may not be unique 
unless lambda is greater than 0. If you take lambda greater than 0 and lambda 1 equal to 0, then the solution for this problem for V is proportional to the largest principal component direction. Now, this second penalty encourages the sparseness and it makes sum of the loadings to be equal to 0. Now, for multiple components the sparse principal components minimize we take minimum over theta v summation i equal to 1 to n you take norm of x c i minus theta v transpose x c i plus lambda summation is k equal to 1 to capital K L 2 norm of V k plus summation k equal to 1 to capital K lambda 1 k you have L 1 norm of V k subject to the restriction that theta transpose theta is equal to I k. Just we write this problem using the multiple components. So, here actually theta is not a vector it is a matrix of order r cross k and uh, v is also r cross k with columns as v k. Again the problem is not jointly convex in v and theta, but if you take this problem for v given theta then it is a convex problem if theta is given then it is convex in V. So, minimization over V given theta can be solved using k elastic net problems. So, for V given theta you have just like elastic net penalty you remember in elastic net penalty you have both kind of penalties the L 2 penalty as well as L 1 penalty. This is your L 2 penalty, this is your L 1 penalty. So, minimization over V given theta is elastic net problem and then you can solve it using k elastic net problems. So, for each small k you have a elastic net problem. So, you can solve it using capital K elastic net problems and minimization over theta given V can be solved by a simple singular value decomposition calculation. Given V this term is given this term is given. So, you just have to minimize this term with respect to theta subject to this restriction. It is simple singular value decomposition calculation or singular value decomposition problem just like the classical principal component analysis. So, you can easily solve it. So, to solve this problem what we do we minimize we start from say some initial value of theta then we minimize over V given theta using k elastic net problems and once you obtain V, we minimize over theta given V which is a simple singular value decomposition calculation just like the classical principal component analysis and then we iterate these steps unless you reach to the point of convergence. So, unless you get convergence and once you get convergence you stop. So, in SPC actually we attempt to find sparse loadings that is a weight vector with only a few active values and unnecessary values or the loadings which do not have much impact become 0. Then principal components are formed as a linear combination of only a few of the original variables. 
in usual principal component analysis all the variables appear a principal component is a linear combination of all the variables whereas in sparse principal component analysis only a few of the original variables appear and loadings of several variables which are not so important becomes zero then it avoids overfitting in a high dimensional data setting just like what lasso does in multiple linear regression model it avoids overfitting and makes some of the loadings to be equal to zero now we consider an example and in this example we have randomly generated the data to see how the sparse principal component analysis works and the our package which we have used is sparse pca and uh, actually we have generated 10000 observations say so initially we have generated the observations on z1 which follow normal zero and the variance is 290 square z2 which has normal distribution with mean zero and variance 300 square uh, we have taken such a large variance so that you get some variability in z1 and z2 then u follows normal zero 100 square so we have generated 10000 observations from each of these distributions all on z1 z2 and u then we define z3 equal to minus 0.1 z1 plus 0.1 z2 plus u and we have formed this vector z which is z1 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 z2 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 z3 z3 again we have generated observations on v which has multivariate normal distribution zero then the variance coherence matrix is identity matrix of order 10 and then we define x equal to z plus v so of course the first four components of z are z1 the next four components of z are z2 but the components of x are different because you have added this vector v in z to obtain x x is of order 10 cross 1 then we have applied the sparse principal component analysis to see how it works for this generated data then uh, we get uh, such kind of performance for different uh, principal components the first principal component has standard deviation 600.583 the second one has 577.244 third one has 138.880 and then these are the eigen values the first three eigen values in fact uh, i have not given here the standard deviations or eigen values corresponding to the next few principal components here i have taken just the principal components which are important now these are the sparse loadings say so in the first principal component the first variable gets loading zero Now notice that if you apply the classical principal component analysis, then no loading becomes zero. Although in 
generating the data, you have repeated z1 here 4 times z2 here 4 times and then you have added a random vector here. So, in x1, x2, x3, x4, when we define principal components, you cannot say that all the four variables should have significant loading or are important in forming the principal component. Say suppose you consider just the first principal component, then it is a linear combination of x1, x2, so on x10. But since x1, x2, x3, x4 are generated so that x1 is equal to z1 plus v1, x2 is equal to z1 plus v2 and so on. All these four variables are not so important for the first principal component. But you, if you apply the classical principal component analysis, you get some loading for all these four components. Similarly, for the x5, x6, x7, x8 also and x9, x10 also. Uh, but when you consider a sparse principal component analysis in first four loadings, all are 0. Then last two loadings are also 0. Here these loadings are 0 and here all these loadings are 0. So, the sparse principal component analysis makes several of these loadings to be equal to 0. The loadings corresponding to the variables which are not so important. Then the explained variance corresponding to the first principal component is very high, corresponding to the second principal component it is also high, corresponding to the third principal component it is high. But after that the explained variance is very small after the third principal component. Then you consider the standard deviations also and proportion of variance. Proportion of variance gives you more clear picture or cumulative proportion of variance also gives you more clear picture. Say on the basis of first principal component, you are able to explain around 50 percent of the variation. Just on the basis of first two principal components, you are able to explain almost 97 percent of the variation. And then if you consider all the three principal components, then you are able to explain almost 99 percent or almost 100 percent actually of the variation. That is why I have not given here the results beyond principal component 3. In fact, if you go up to principal component 2, you get more than 96, in fact around 97 percent of the information. So, there is very little information loss. So, this is the beauty of sparse principal component analysis. It makes several loadings to be equal to 0, the loadings corresponding to unimportant variables. Now, you consider principal component analysis leverage and outlier detection. You remember in the regression problem, we can detect outliers using regression leverage and regression leverage is actually the diagonals of hat matrix x, x transpose x, inverse x transpose. So, you focus on the diagonals of this matrix, then you obtain y cap equal to h y which is the predicted value of y and then using this hat matrix you can identify y i's which have very high impact on this predicted value and then you can identify the outliers also. 
Then uh, in principal component al analysis also, we can use the hat matrix, how we define this hat matrix in the principal component analysis. Uh, for that purpose, we consider the singular value decomposition of x c. So, we write x c equal to u lambda to the power half v transpose, which is equal to u hat v. Then instead of computing S V D directly, here we compute S V D of X C X C transpose equal to U lambda U transpose. What is X C X C transpose? It is U lambda to the power half V transpose V lambda to the power half U transpose then V transpose V is identity matrix. So, you get U lambda V Q transpose. So, to obtain U and lambda, we consider the singular value decomposition of X C X C transpose and then you get U and lambda. Then we estimate V transpose using least squares to say x c is equal to u lambda to the power half v transpose plus say e. Now, this is in the form of multiple linear regression model. And then if you consider it as the multiple linear regression model, then hat matrix is h equal to u hat, u hat transpose, u hat inverse, u hat transpose because u hat which is equal to u lambda to the power half may be considered as an estimate of design matrix in the estimation of v. Say in multiple linear regression model, this is your design matrix. So, for estimating V transpose, you may consider this matrix as your design matrix. And using this U lambda to the power half, you can obtain this hat matrix. If you write U lambda to the power half equal to U hat and you consider it as your design matrix, then hat matrix is this. And then we substitute the value of U hat which is equal to u lambda to the power half. So, you get u lambda to the power half, then u transpose, u hat transpose is equal to lambda to the power half, u transpose u lambda to the power half inverse lambda to the power half u transpose. And then this is equal to u lambda to the power half here this mat u transpose u is equal to i. So, you get lambda here. So, you get lambda inverse then lambda to the power half u transpose. So, ultimately you get u u transpose. So, this is your hat matrix and v transpose is equal to lambda to the power minus half u transpose x c. This is your v transpose. Then diagonals of this hat matrix are say h1, h2, hn and these diagonals provide you PCA leverage. And then xc hat is equal to u lambda to the power half v transpose, then we substitute the value of v transpose here which is lambda to the power minus half u transpose x c. So, you get u u transpose x c here, which is equal to h x c. x hat c is equal to h x c. You just compare it with y hat equal to h y in the multiple linear regression model. So, PCA leverage actually approximately represents the influence of each observation on the principal components and the fitted values in x c. So, see from here. 
the approximation works well in practice. And then we set a leverage threshold. So, suppose T is the number of principal components, then T by n is mean leverage of n observations. We divide this T by the number of observations. So, this is the mean leverage. And if the leverage of ith observation exceeds say alpha times the median, say median of h1, h2, hn is denoted by m h. It is labeled as leverage outlier and usually we take m h lying between 3 to 8. So, this is how you can detect the outliers in principal component analysis. Uh, we use linear principal component analysis to discover low dimensional linear structure hidden in the data. So, if the data is concentrated around a low dimensional feature space or a low dimensional linear structure is hidden in the data, then you can make use of linear principal component analysis for reducing the dimension. But uh, what to do when data is concentrated on a lower dimensional non-linear manifold? So, you take this kind of data. So, data, data is concentrated around a non-linear hidden structure. Then suppose we apply linear principal component analysis to this data set then it might result in non-optimal dimensional t reduction. It may not work. So, uh, we have also used uh, this bioconductor which is uh, open free software and then when uh, we have taken this 3D plot of RNA sequencing gene expression count data which is available in bioconductor. Again here you observe that the data is concentrated around a non-linear feature space. So, some non-linear hidden structure is there in the data and you have to identify this kind of non-linear structure and then you cannot use the linear principal component analysis to obtain this non-linear structure. One option is to use polynomial PCA. So, first we transform the input variables and then we use a technique which is just like the linear principal component analysis. And we focus attention on the smallest of few eigenvalues for non-linear dimensionality reduction. So, first we consider quadratic PCA, so x is r cross 1 vector, then we transform it into an extended p cross 1 vector x star. So, x includes the original r variables plus r quadratic powers and then r into r minus 1 upon 2 cross products of the elements of x. So, you have x 1 up to x r, then you take x 1 square, x r square, then you take the cross product terms x 1, x 2, x 1, x 3 and so on, x r minus 1, x r. So, this is how you get x star. So, x star is p cross 1 extended vector. So, here p is equal to 2 r plus r into r minus 1 upon 2. So, for example, if you have bivariate data, then x star is equal to x 1, x 2, x 1 square, x 2 square x 1 into x 2. Then we carry out linear PCA on x star. If 
r is equal to 10, the dimension of x star is p equal to 10 plus 10 plus 10 c 2 that is 635. So, you get this kind of x star. Further for r equal to 20, you get the dimension of x star as 20 plus 20 plus 20 c 2 that is 230. Then we can also use the kernel methods for non-linear principal component analysis, but uh, before going to kernel principal component analysis, first uh, we will discuss in brief the kernel methods. Kernel methods are a set of techniques used in machine learning to address classification, regression and other prediction issues when you have some kind of non-linear structure. And kernel function actually measures the similarity of two data points to one another in a high dimensional feature space. And then in kernel methods actually we convert the input data into high dimensional feature space which makes it simpler to distinguish between classes or generate predictions. So, basically we convert the input space into a high dimensional feature space using the kernel method and uh, then we use it for classification purpose or for generating the predictions. And uh, some of the examples of kernel methods are kernel principal component analysis which we are going to discuss here or the kernel density estimation. I am going to discuss the kernel density estimation in this lecture in just very brief and we will also discuss kernel support vector machine in one of the subsequent lectures. Now, now first uh, I consider kernel uh, or non parametric density estimation just in very brief. Just I want to give you some idea of non parametric density estimation and how can we use the kernel method for non parametric density estimation. Now, suppose you have n observations x 1, x 2, x n. How we make the histogram? Suppose all these observations are contained in interval a to b, closed interval a to b. Then for making histogram what we do? We divide the interval a b a is the minimum possible value and b is the upper limit or maximum possible value of x 1, x 2, x n. So, we divide this interval into L non overlapping intervals. Say T naught is equal to A to A plus h n, T 1 is A plus h n to A plus 2 h n and so on. T L minus 1 is A plus L minus 1 h n to A plus L h n. Then we define indicators function say i t l x which takes value 1 if x belongs to the interval t l and it takes value 0 if x does not belong to t l. Then the number of observations in t l is say n l then n l is equal to summation i equal to 1 to n i t l x i. So, if x i belongs to t l then it takes value 1, it, if x i does not belong to t l then it takes value 0. So, if you su take summation over all values of i then n l times you get 1 and remaining values are 0. So, ultimately you get the number of observations in T L and then we define the histogram as say p hat x equal to 1 upon n h n summation L equal to 0 to L minus 1 we take summation over all intervals n L i T L x. Obviously, this takes value 1 if x belongs to T l otherwise it is 0. Now, suppose x belongs to T l then what you get? Say p head x is equal to then you get n l here. 
divided by n h n n is actually the total number of observations and h n is the width of the interval. Now, p hat x may be considered as an estimator of the density function of x. In fact, you can write p hat x as p hat x equal to 1 upon n h n is the number of observations, h is the width. Actually, you have taken h equal to h n. Just to simplify the notations, we have replaced h n by h. And then you have indicator function x minus x i upon h. Now, this indicator function actually takes value 1 if you have an observation x i which lie between x plus h to x minus h. x is the midpoint of the histogram. So, we are using those observations for estimating this density function which lie in this interval with x as the center point. So, we define iz as this indicator function. Then you can use this histogram for estimating the density function, but the problem with this histogram is that it is not smooth and continuous. And so, it is not an appropriate estimation of continuous density. You cannot estimate a continuous density using histogram. It is not an appropriate estimator of continuous density. Then we use the kernel trick. We use kernel density estimation. So, we define p head h x equal to 1 upon n h summation i equal to 1 to n. Now, you have replaced the indicator function by a function k x minus x i upon h. Again, h is equal to h n. Where k h is greater than or equal to 0 and if you integrate k h from minus infinity to plus infinity, you get 1. And this function k x is called the kernel function and h is called the window width. These two values means the kernel function and the window width these two determine the smoothness of the density function, how smooth your density function is. Say, if you take the kernel function as the indicator function, then your density is not at all smooth. If your window width h is small, then your kernel density estimator is more smooth. But what happens when you take the window width to be very small, then you may not have any observation in the interval of window width h. So, it may you are not having any information. So, somewhere you have to compromise how much window width you should take. Now, some of the popular kernel functions which uh, one can use in kernel density estimation are rectangular which is 1 upon 2 i mod x less than or equal to 1. This is rectangular kernel function. Then one can use the triangular kernel function which is 1 minus mod x i mod x less than or equal to 1. By weight kernel function is quite popular. And then one can use the cosine kernel function and the usual Gaussian kernel function, which is just like the normal density function 1 upon under root 2 pi sigma e to the power minus x square upon twice sigma square. 
Further, the choice of window width is usually taken as 1.06 s n to power minus 1 upon 5 for the Gaussian kernel. For other kernels also, you can estimate the window width. I am not going into much details. Here, s is the sample standard deviation. This kernel density estimation can be used for estimating multivariate density is also and uh, in fact, for large samples it provides a consistent estimator of the true density that is it converges to the true density as n tends to infinity or the sample size tends to infinity. In this lecture, first we have discussed sparse principal component analysis, which makes use of lasso penalty for making some of the unimportant loadings to be equal to 0, the loadings corresponding to the unimportant variables. Then we have also considered a method for outlier detection in linear principal component analysis. Now, sometimes in high dimensional data, instead of linear structure, some non-linear structure is hidden in the data. Then how to handle such kind of problems? So, we have discussed non-linear principal component analysis. And then in the next lecture, I will consider kernel principal component analysis, which also obtains the non-linear hidden structure in the data. Here I am going to stop. Thank you. of literary snippet. British humor does not have a very high standing in the world. When people talk about it, they usually do so with a certain degree of disparagement. Yet all this is, I think, rather unfortunate because if I read out to you a certain section from Jerome K. Jerome's famous novel Three Men in a Boat, you will realize that not only is British humor genuinely funny, it is probably even better than some of the other samples of humorous writings that you might have read in the recent past. The story that I am going to read out is told by Jerome, who thinks he is suffering from some kind of a malady. I remember going to the British Museum one day to read up the treatment <coughs> for some slight ailment of which I had a touch. <coughs> Hay fever, I fancy it was. I got down the book and read all I came to read. And then, in an unthinking moment, I idly turned the leaves and began to indolently study diseases generally. I forgot which was the first distemper I plunged into, some fearful, devastating scourge, I know. And before I had glanced half down the list of premonitory symptoms, it was borne in upon me that I had fairly got it. I sat for a while, frozen with horror. And then, in the listlessness of despair, I again turned over the pages. I came to typhoid fever, read the symptoms, discovered that I had 
typhoid fever. Must have had it for months without knowing it. Wondered what else I had got. Turned up, sent Vitus's dance. Found, as I expected, that I had that too. Began to get interested in my case and determined to sift it to the bottom and so started alphabetically. Read up Ague and learned that I was sickening from it and that the acute stage would commence in about another fortnight. Bright's disease, I was uh, relieved to find, I had only in a modified form. And uh, so far as that was concerned, I might live for years. Cholera I had with uh, severe complications and uh, diphtheria I seemed to have been born with. I plodded conscientiously through the 26 letters and the only malady I could conclude I had not got was housemaid's knee. I felt rather hurt about this at first. It seemed somehow to be a sort of slight. Why hadn't I got housemaid's knee? Why this invidious reservation? After a while, however, less grasping feelings prevailed. I reflected that I had every other known malady in the pharmacology and I grew less selfish and determined to do without housemaid's knee. Gout in its most malignant stage, it would appear, had seized me without my being aware of it. And zymosis. I had zymosis evidently from boyhood. There were no more diseases after zymosis, uh, so I concluded there was nothing else the matter with me. I sat and pondered. I thought, what an interesting case I must be from a medical point of view. Uh, what an acquisition I should be to a class. Students would have no need to walk the hospitals if they had me. I was a hospital in myself. All they need to do would be to walk around me and, after that, take the diploma. Then I wondered how long I had to live. I tried to examine myself. I felt my pulse. Uh, I could not, at first, feel any pulse at all. Then, all of a sudden, it seemed to start off. I pulled out my watch and timed it. I made it 147 to a minute. I tried to feel my heart. I could not feel my heart. It had been beating, but now it had stopped beating. I have since been induced to come to the opinion that it must have been there all the time and must have been beating, but I cannot account for it. I patted myself all over my front from what I call my waist up to my head and uh, I went a bit around each side and a little way up the back. But I could not feel or hear anything. I uh, tried to look at my tongue. I stuck it out as far as ever it would go and I shut one eye and tried to examine it with the other. I could only see the tip and the only thing that I could gain from that was to feel more certain than before that I had scarlet fever. I had walked into the reading room, a happy, healthy man. I crawled out a decrepit wreck. Our friend next visited a doctor and there he got a prescription which said to eat well, to go for long walks and not to worry his heads over things he didn't understand. See you in the next episode.
of literary snippets. Hi, my name is Gillette Sam and I teach sociology uh, at IIT Kanpur. Uh, today I am going to uh, tell you about uh, an important debate that is occurring around uh, the concept of globalization. Uh, now, uh, uh, within the study of globalization, there are two sets of people. The first set of people uh, uh, argue that globalization is uh, very real. It's something that is happening around us all the time. And in fact, it's something that is gaining strength over time. The second set of people, uh, and the first set of people are, are called the globalists. The second set of people are not so convinced that globalization is something real uh, and they, ref they are referred to as skeptics. Now the skeptics argue that uh, unlike what the globalists would have us believe that there are things and ideas and people that are traveling across the world across multiple borders and that we live in an interconnected world, actually there are many parts of the world and many types of people who are completely left out of these kind of global flows. So they would give you the example of uh, typically indigenous communities who live across the world. And they would argue that indigenous communities, particularly tribes that are uh, 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 in terms of their physical location, their lives continue participating in any kind of global flows. That even though uh, people may live in and they may not be directly flows, uh, their lives today are still being influenced by at a global scale. Uh, you can take the example of so, uh, for instance, if uh, if there is an in no contact with uh, anyone else, uh, but they live in an area experiencing uh, an increase in sea levels, and in all of this may be attributed to people in neighboring countries across the globe. So in that sense, even though directly participating in global flows, your everyday life is happening around the world. Uh, another argument uh, is uh, in regard to what now initially when discussions about globalization started, Nineties, um, the expectation was that nation state uh, as an entity is going to wither away, cease to be important. Uh, now, could point out to uh, the world today and say, important. Uh, we still live our lives based on we were born in or which nation we have citizenship in important for us uh, to which globalists would argue that the nation state will cease to be important uh, uh, rather than facing a situation that the nation state is important over time uh, we actually may be where in addition to the nation state, there are other laws that shape our lives and they shape our lives uh, on an everyday basis.